So let's move on to our final speaker, uh, Desmond, who will talk, to, who will walk us through the challenges of conducting research in lower middle income countries with a focus on students. Desmond Jubab is a Cameroonian health policy consultant based in Accra, Ghana. He works with Operation Smile and also leads research projects specifically focused on health financing for surgical care in low middle income countries. Prior to joining Operation Smile, Mr. Jumbam was a health policy analyst with a program in global surgery and social change at Harvard Medical Schools, where he led and advised on the development of national surgical obstetric, obstetric and anesthesia plans in several countries. Thank you, and please help me welcome Desmond. Uh, thank you. Um, hello, everybody. Uh, first, I'd like to start by um, thanking Teresa and um, the Karolinska De Decolonizing Global Health uh, team for inviting me. I feel honored. Um, and I also like to thank the other pan panelists, Ella, Christian, and Miriam, because I have learned a lot so far. Um, and, and I guess there's, there's pros and cons of being the last speaker because you learn quite a bit and, um, you know, some of your material is, is covered, which I, which I suppose is a good thing because there is uh, some agreement um, in, in what we are talking about. Uh, so my, my talk is uh, titled Neocolonialism um, in Global Health. I guess the outline for my talk, I'll tell you a little bit about myself so you have uh, an idea of you know, my background and my perspective and, 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 and um, some of the ideas why I'm saying some of the things that I'm saying. I will do a, you know, quick uh, case study, which um, I would love for you all to just uh, type in the, the comment section, your responses to that case. And then we'll go a little bit deeper into the talk and talk about, um, you know, colonialism um, and global health within the research practice and education spaces. Um, we'll also talk about some uh, uh, initial reactions that I've, that I've observed um, to this global uh, health decoloniality, decolonization movement. Um, and then finally, we'll talk about some, some uh, solutions, uh, the way out. So let me start by telling you a little bit about myself. Um, so I am a Cameroonian. Um, I, I, grew up in, um, I grew up here. Uh, I always wanted to, uh, you know, get a better education in order to to help um, improve the healthcare of, of people. Yeah, so I had the opportunity to go to the U.S. in 2010, um, you know, with the idea of of going to medical school to becoming a medical doctor because, uh, you know, I thought that in order to improve people's health, that is the only way to go about doing it. Uh, but it turns out that there there are thousands of ways to improve people's health. Uh, beyond becoming a, a clinician. Um, and I quickly discovered that, um, you know, as I was studying and then as I came back on the continent and, and explored the health challenges, I realized that what I'm actually passionate about is, is around health systems um, and, and improving the, the structures that, that exist um, in delivering uh, care. Um, so uh, when I was in the US, um, after I decided to change this trajectory, I thought, well, public health um, would be the way to go instead of, of being a clinician. Um, and so, and, and well, public health, yes, that makes sense. Um, but since, uh, you know, I wanted to work in Africa, I wanted to work back home. I thought, well, global health, that, maybe that's, that's what that is, right? So I applied to a program um, you know, in the U.S., a global health program at the University of Notre Dame, um, you know, that, uh, you know, aims to improve uh, health care, access to health care in um, low and middle income countries. Um, one of, I, you know, as I was trying to get, a, get into the program, um, I thought I was the ideal candidate for this program. Um, and I quickly realized some of the hurdles of getting into some of these um, uh, education programs that, that currently exist, uh, global health education programs that are popping up all over the place. The first one being uh, uh, scholarships, finances for those from low and middle income countries to get into this program. I had a difficult time um, getting a scholarship to this program. I was fortunate enough that I was 
you know, a drive away from the school. So I went there and I, and I really pleaded, you know, made my case. Um, you know, in the end, thanks to, uh, you know, intervention of the president of the university, I got a full scholarship for which I'm grateful for. But think about it. Uh, most of the students from LMICs who apply to these programs are, um, you know, in Africa, in Latin America, in Southeast Asia, wherever, um, will not have that privilege of driving to the school to, to make their case for why they should be considered in this program. So, so, so that's one of the first uh, challenges that I realized um, that, you know, people like myself have into getting into, into masses and global health programs and in, in the North. Um, the other challenge that I quickly discovered was a, a serious lack of inclusion and diversity in, in, in the program that, that I was um, involved in. You know, of the about 25 or so uh, Masters in Global Health students, there were just two um, from low and middle income country, myself and um, you know, a, a, a classmate from Kazakhstan. Um, the rest were, were all Americans, right? And so this, this was, again, a challenge. I, I, it made me question, you know, who these programs were designed uh, for. Um, it also made me qu question the quality of, of the education when there's such lack of um, diversity in, in students, but also professors from the areas where, uh, you know, the programs claim to want to to, to, to support. So that's, that, that was my, my introduction into, into global health education. Um, I then graduated from there um, and had the opportunity to uh, work at the program in global surgery and social change as a research assistant. Um, I was there for, for three years and then I was, and I worked also as a po uh, policy um, analyst. Uh, part of the primary objective of that program is, is strengthening access to surgical systems in low and middle income countries, um, you know, as a reaction to the Lancet Commission on Global Surgery that emphasized the challenges at the feast. Um, but it's, this is, you know, my introduction to global health practice. Um, and I started observing uh, some, some things that were, I, I found quite troubling um, in the way uh, global health was being practiced. So this, this is some of the work that I was involved in, in you know, working with the Ministry of Health of Tanzania from a policy perspective to develop uh, national uh, plans to address um, you know, deficient surgical systems. Um, and and in, in doing this work, I started to observe some, some really uh, you know, uh, troubling ways in which global health was practiced. So for example, um, I was part of the pro a program that aimed to um, provide leadership and teamwork training to, um, you know, surgical teams in Tanzania, right? And, and the idea for the project uh, was to, um, you know, get the community, get the surgical team, the surgical community there to provide a, a definition of what they understand by leadership, what they understand by teamwork, um, and there was a two-day workshop that, that was held for that, uh, you know, that kind of to get the buy-in in, in a sense, right? And I remember at the end of that two-day workshop, just being, you know, befuddled, just, you know, I wondered, is that it? Is that what we're talking about when we say buy-in? Because the definitions that, you know, uh, of teamwork and leadership that have come out are really def preconceived definitions, um, you know, they're not definitions that I heard at the workshop, right? Um, they're definitions that fit into the, 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 the prior proposal that have already been, been accepted and have already been approved, um, but it's checking the tick boxes that we had. So I had, I had all of these, uh, you know, uh, some of these issues that, that I noticed. Um, the other issue that I noticed um, was, I, and I think this is the fundamental issue that I see in, in global health, uh, in the challenge of decolonizing global health is that there's much talk about what is right. Um, you know, we all understand to an extent that the right things to say, um, you know, the, the right boxes to check, the right things to say in our manuscripts, right? Um, you know, we, we understand that, you know, if, if we're developing a global health 
research project to publish in BMJ Global Health or wherever. Um, and we don't have enough African sounding names uh, for research that is conducted in Tanzania. Um, you know, we're going to be, be, there's going to be an issue for that um, reprimand on, on social media or wherever. Um, <clears throat> and so rather than actually addressing the fundamental issue um, from the beginning in, in developing research uh, proposals, uh, which is including uh, the local team, including the local collaborators in the ideation of the research and in the decision making and in the implementation, um, we uh, have come up with, you know, some solutions like uh, the tokenism that, that we talked about, you know, where at the end we just bring in some, some, some random names um, who have not really contributed um, or, you know, we don't give uh, credit to, to um, those who have been working on the project on the ground. Um, and so the, these, a lot of these and, and much more troubled me. Um, you know, and so I wrote an article, an editorial in uh, BMJ Global Health, um, you know, how not to write about, about global health. It's, it's a satire. Um, you know, I, 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 I thought this is, this issue is something that needs to be addressed. And, and quite a number of people are writing about decolonizing global health, but it all seems too academic. Um, it all, you know, it's, it, it's a very serious topic. Um, but I also wanted to, to draw attention to the ridiculousness of the way um, global health is still being practiced um, in, in many uh, institutions. Um, and so I wrote this, this editorial, um, you know, kind of, uh, you know, poking fun at, at the way global health is still being practiced. And, and it, it's a how to do global health. Um, uh, and, and so when I wrote this editorial, and I think that's, you know, one of the main reasons I'm talking to you here today, um, it resonated with quite a few people, but I realized that I wasn't the only one um, bringing these issues into, into uh, discussing these issues. There was, um, there have been, you know, hundreds and hundreds of articles and, and, you know, newspapers and, you know, journals and podcasts and, you know, so quite, quite a number of articles calling for the decolonizing of uh, global health. Um, <clears throat> so I'd like to, to, you know, take us through a short case, um, you know, and at the end I'll, I'll have a question. So imagine that you are um, a Cameroonian uh, researcher, uh, a Cameroonian student, um, you want to be an epidemiologist, um, um, a, a microbiologist, um, you get uh, uh, and uh, you get an opportunity to travel to Belgium because um, you know the, the capacity to train here in Cameroon is, is quite limited, um, and so you travel to to Belgium. You know you, you study, you get your your PhD, um, you know, and then you you deter determine that well, my primary goal is to to help Cameroonians, help my fellow Cameroonians. You return to Cameroon. But again, when you get back, you, re, you find out that it's, it's very difficult to practice the microbiology that you have studied uh, because uh, of, of the lack of equipment and, and, and samples and, and, you know, um, and so you, you end up being a field epidemiologist, right? You, while you're a field epidemiologist, um, you know, uh, you get a call about some random disease that is, you know, taking over um, a, a remote village. Right, you travel to that that remote village, being the only uh, immunologist in the country, um, and then you you assess the situation. You you know without actually even knowing what the disease is, you gather samples, um, but again you don't have the capacity to analyze it, so you send it to your previous colleagues in Belgium. They then analyze um, the the samples um, and discover that this is a new disease. So my question to you all, and you can put it in the chat is, you know, who do you think deserves the credit for uh, this? Will it be you who took the samples um, or would it be the, the, the Belgian scientists who, um, you know, who analyzed the data and published the results or um, both or none, I, you know, uh, who, who, who would you say? You can just type your comments, um, your responses in the comment section. 
Okay, I cannot see the chat. Uh, oh, there you go. Okay, so uh, see, I see a lot. Every you know, uh, somebody says a uh, both. Okay, both, both, both. Right. So most people seem to be in, in agreement that uh, both should receive uh, the credit. Um, so this is quite interesting because it's, it's an actual case. This is this is something that did happen in real life. Um, this is Dr. Jean-Jacques Muyembe. He um, is the, he is actually a Congolese uh, immunologist um, who um, discovered uh, Ebola, right? And up until recently, um, he was not credited for this because the, the scientists um, in Belgium who did the analysis of the samples, and I, he actually risked his life collecting samples. Right, but the, but the, he never got the credit for this. So the, these are the types of, of examples, and these are real examples um, that we talk about when we talk about the, the, the coloniality of global health. Um, so I'll just now go through um, a few uh, issues in uh, global health as it relates to research. Right, so uh, sadly, you know, this whole idea of um, Parachutes, you know, parachute research um, and parasites still very much exist in global health. And, and, and you know, Ella alluded to it um, in her presentation, right? Where research priorities for the problems in the quote unquote South are still being set by researchers or, or, or funders uh, in the global North. Um, high income researchers parachute into low and middle income countries, collect samples fly out, analyze the data, and publish in their journals. Um, you know, the researchers in low and middle income countries still um, do not have access to funding, global health funding, right? So in most instances, the funding comes through um, high income countries. And, and again, that determines the priority. There's still this idea of the, the little brother effect uh, that is persistent in, in, in global health, where uh, researchers in uh, low and middle income countries are perceived as just beneficiaries um, of research from the global north. So they don't really have any decision um, making capacity. They're seen as mere data collectors, even when they are specialized. Uh, so I think this is, this is deeply problematic for, for many reasons, which I'll go into later. Um, there are issues around dissemination. I, for one, um, you know, I studied, like I mentioned, I studied in an uh, institution, global health institution in the U.S., and I had opportunities to go to conferences like uh, CUGH, Consortium for Universities of Global Health. I always struggled at such conferences, you know, because there's something bizarre and something odd about, um, you know, research from particular countries uh, being primarily disseminated um, at these uh, global health conferences um, in the global north where those who would be beneficiaries of those research would never would have a hard time coming to for, for a myriad of reasons um, you know sometimes even the research that are that are presented at these these conferences um, if you go to, to where the research is conducted, nobody has an idea that that research was conducted. Nobody has an idea that of the findings. Um, nobody, is, nobody uses that research to uh, develop programs to, to help their communities. So I find the, the, the dissemination of information in global health deeply problematic. And this also goes with journals, you know, the, um, you know, the, uh, findings are mostly published behind paywalls. And it's ironic because as I was developing this talk, you know, there were, there were articles that I thought this would be interesting, but I couldn't access them, right? Articles on, uh, you know, uh, research uh, coloniality, right? I couldn't access them because they were behind paywalls, right? And so this is, this is a major um, issue, but I, I like to point out the, the 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 how expansive this issue is because it goes beyond global health, right? I have a friend who is doing his his PhD in history at Northwestern, and the reason he's at Northwestern in African history, I should say, is because the largest repository of African uh, archives 
is at Northwestern University. It's not in Africa. And that is a sad reality. Um, it's true, not just for health, but true for, for other, um, other fields. Um, this, uh, Ella has already pointed out too, you know, there's, there's some evidence uh, for, for this um, in, in, in authorship. Um, and, but the, the point is not really um, around authorship, right? And, and I want to make this point clear um, because w w if we focus on the authorship part, we miss the point. Um, we, we, it leads to token authorships, right? Um, say Abimola captured it uh, very well in, in this um, editorial, right? He says, the primary problem is that it is unfair and, and even misleading and colonial to pay undue attention to the foreign gaze, right? And if the academic literature in which we give priority does not reflect the local experts, um, that local experts are at the forefront of addressing local problems, then there is something deeply wrong with that literature because it does not reflect reality. And this is very true. Uh, the more I read global health literature and, and research, the more I, I find this huge gap between the realities on the ground and between um, what is being published, right? So, so it's, it's, it's a fundamental issue that it does not reflect the reality on the ground if um, it's not representative of those in the countries where we um, conduct the research. And now let's turn to, to global health education. I'm not spend too much time on this because I've already spoken about it, but we all know this, this uh, proliferation of um, academic global health programs. Um, there's undergraduates, there's graduates, there's postgraduates, fellowships. Um, most of them are located in high income countries. Um, most of them are quite expensive, especially you know, if, you, if you're looking at it from the perspective of someone from the low and middle income countries, um, there's limited diversity. And so we must ask ourselves the questions, who are these programs for? And do they perpetuate these colonial practices and mindsets that we are talking about? Um, this is, again, is, is, a, is a diagram that I, I believe Miriam showed, um, that, that just shows the locations of global health master's programs and the cost. Uh, again, there are issues in the practice of global health, right? Um, priorities for, for global health programs determined by external funders. Um, most funding goes to NGOs in the global north, even when there's capacity in the global south to implement these programs. Um, I, I noticed someone mentioned that in, in the chat. Um, so international NGOs get, get a lot of their attention. Um, uh, you know, 99% 90, 90 of global health NGOs are headquarters in, the, in North America and Europe. So, so there, there, there are so many issues, even in the, even in the practice of global health. Uh, this is, this is a, a, a comment from Shea and, um, uh, oops, sorry, um, and Madhu Pai from in the global health. In, in, uh, Lancet, in the Lancet, and they just really talk about the pervasiveness of this um, colonialism in global health, right? It runs in, our, in the way we set our agendas, in, in whose voices are heard, um, in the histories and the knowledge, the way we, we represent knowledge. Um, this, this is a working definition of global health colonialism that, that I've, been, I've been thinking about. Um, you know, you know, I think about it as, you know, how ideas of all colonial powers continue to be perpetuated and practiced unconsciously or consciously in global health research practice and funding through ingrained inequitable systems. Um, that's a working definition that I that I I have of, you know, global health uh, colonialism. Obviously, there are other definitions. Um, out there, you know, Dr. Tedros uh, about a year ago talked about the hangover of the colonial uh, mentality. Um, there's this definition by Amibola and Pai that uh, Mariam already referenced to. Uh, so here I, I've been observing some reactions to this idea of decolonizing global health. And 
from what I can see, there are two basic reactions. Um, there's, it's, there's either denial or there's acceptance that, that uh, colonialism is a problem in global health. Um, so with denial, we hear people like researchers say, you know, we just want to conduct impactful research to help them. You know, you're, you're, you're just wasting time with this colonialism. You're not actually doing any work. Um, you know, and implementers will say, well, we just want to help the children that kind of, you know, we've got good intentions. What are you talking about? Um, right. But again, these are deeply problematic um, because they just continue to perpetuate um, the exploitative colonial practices and prevents um, these researchers and implementers from actually listening to, to the issues that we're raising. Um, and understanding the fundamental uh, problem. Uh, acceptance, there is some acceptance, which you know, is rightfully so, or sometimes due to social pressure. And sometimes what that leads to is we, we get some band-aids, right? We, we hear superficial statements on, on Twitter, on, on websites, um, you know, superficial policies. Uh, we get gift authorships and token leadership positions within the organization, but it fails to address some of the issues because even sometimes with these token leadership positions, um, you know, we get a leader from an LMICs, but they do not listen to that leader. They do not listen to what, what that person has to say. Um, so they f these, these fail to address our root cause, and it's really a failure of introspection. So what can we do? Um, a, f a few ideas come to mind. You know, I, I always like to emphasize that the problem is not with North to South collaborations, right? We are primary concerns with the ones that are exploitative, um, but there are some, some excellent uh, models. Um, you know, I'm sure Christian has some from his experience. Um, you know, I, I, I think in order to deal with the denial, the solution is to listen first and listen carefully because um, you know, if you don't listen carefully, you'll miss the, the, the problem that we're, we're raising. Um, and then there should be some individual and, and, and actually institutional um, introspection, right? On the, trying to evaluate your own underlying motives uh, for, for doing global health, um, your assumptions that the underlying assumptions in your approach to global health. Um, and, and then we develop some concrete uh, strategies for, um, you know, how to prevent your, you know, yourselves, and I should really say ourselves, um, from, uh, you know, perpetuating the colonial practices. You know, uh, Miriam mentioned, you know, studying history. I very much agree with that. I think uh, global health is practiced in an apolitical and ahistorical uh, way. Um, and, and I think this is very, uh, you know, it's, it's a problem. Um, you know, consider who your project benefits the most. Does it benefit you primarily, or does it benefit the community that you seek to serve? Um, how do you ensure that your collaborators are working with you and not for you? Um, and, and, and again, there's a need to speak up about these issues. Um, I very much think of this as you know, in similar ways to the, the, the colonialism uh, prior to a lot of our countries getting independence, right? You know, we had great leaders who were adamant, who spoke, who fought for our independence. We need to do the same way to dismantle these uh, uh, institutions that, that, that remain. Um, just again, a few points here. I've already talked about this. Um, you know, uh, we need more than good intentions. Um, you know, you need to ask yourselves a few questions. Who is this benefiting? You know, what are my personal motivations for doing this? Is it compassion? Is it curiosity? Is it to boost my CV? Um, am I the per best person for the job? Who will it benefit? So it's just a few ideas. And, I, and I'll close with this slide. Um, you know, global health will not decolonize itself. We all have our, our part to play. Um, those from high income countries have a part to play, um, but those from um, low income countries, the global south, as Christian mentioned, um, have a fundamental role to play in this. And Christian, I noted uh, your question because I like the way you, you, you stated it, right? How do we, from the global south, 
um, elevate our voice, raise this concern, drive, be the primary drivers for the decoloniality um, of global health. Um, with that, um, I'll thank you all for your time. Thank you for listening to me and my ideas. Uh, I look forward to discussing with you all and the other panelists. Thank you.